Recording in progress. Perfect. And we'll get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. And um, since uh, there are a, a, a bunch of new folks registered um, who are going to be enjoying this on recording, I'll I'll introduce myself, um, even, even though I know the folks, the folks uh, here, here, here with us all at once, synchronously. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club, our weekly uh, community education program where we talk about everyday life brain stuff. And I'm just going to share slides. I'm never queued up, never ever. All right, so um, this topic we is a long time coming. We've been wanting to do a brain club on this for a while um, because school bullying is something we think about and talk about here in the A to B village like a lot, um, and uh, it 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 as we'll, we'll soon hear about, um, has some uh, very significant implications, which is why it's really important to us to have this community conversation. So um, this is part of the theme we've been taking on this month about big conversations. Um, this summer, we, uh, we, we, we took on kind of like zooming out, rethinking some of our big systems of society and of what it means to be a healthy, connected community and um, identifying some of the assumptions that get made and unlearning a lot of them, uh, the so-called brain rules of our society. And, 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 and now uh, applying that to these, these hard conversations um, because there are many things that have, have, have been going on for a really long time, but just because they've been going on for a really long time doesn't mean that they're healthy. And in fact, they are very much not healthy. And um, this, this uh, is, is an opportunity to zoom out and rethink the factors that contributed to these things and where do we go from here. And because we do have a few new folks to bring club, I'll just go over some ground rules. You can participate however you are comfortable. Um, you can have your video on or off. And even if your video is on, you do not need to conform to any kind of like default format of participation. Uh, we, we, in fact, actively discourage um, masking or complying with any kind of like social defaults like eye contact or eye contact with the camera. So in fact, we, you know, please walk, move, fidget, take breaks, and you can communicate however you are most comfortable, whether that be unmuting and, and shouting it out, typing in the chat box, gesturing, whatever works for you. And safety here is really important to us. Um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important that we respect and protect one another's access needs. And so while you are welcome to talk about anything um, that you're comfortable talking about, we just ask that if there's anything that you personally experienced as traumatic or distressing, we just ask you to give a content warning to give everyone um, a heads up so that others can then either listen with informed consent or turn their sound off or leave the room for a minute. And, um, and, and um, then I can, I'll, I'll let everyone know in the chat box when that topic is over. But the other thing about access needs is that since we only have 60 minutes together, um, we are going to ask you to be focusing on solutions tonight. Um, this topic can be, um, you know, we, we could talk about this topic and the description of this topic you know, for, 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 for a year, we could have a year long brain club describing this problem because of how common and how profoundly adversely impactful this is. And we really wanna talk about concrete specific solutions today. Before we start that, I'm just gonna show you as Matthew was talking about before, um, if you would like closed captioning and they're not popping up automatically, um, depending on what version of Zoom you have, Look for either the live transcript closed captioning icon or the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. 
And if they are popping up automatically still, um, you, can, you can do the same thing to turn them off. All right, so I will do a quick um, introduction and you know, big, big thanks to David and Theodore and Sophia for, for their help in putting together some of our background literature that I'll frame this conversation around and then we'll jump right into community problem solving. Um, quick recap. Um, for those new to Brain Club, this month we've been talking about access needs. So access needs, anything required to meaningfully and fully participate in one's environment or community. And everybody, regardless of how your brain learns, thinks, communicates, everybody has access needs. And this can be things in the physical environment, emotional, communication, you know, any kind of any, things that are um, uh, what you and your nervous system require to participate. And when we think about safety and everything that goes into that, safety from anything, including bullying, is a prerequisite for inclusion. So when we talk about inclusion and belonging being the goal, safety is a prerequisite for inclusion. And so that is why we at All Brains Belong think that this is something that we can't go any longer without talking about because safety from bullying is a prerequisite for inclusion. And when we talk about bullying, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a repetitive pattern of aggression that creates an imbalance of power or strength. And this can take any form. It can be Verbal, physical, cyberbullying, it can be uh, social or relational bullying, uh, influencing reputation, for example. Sometimes there are some myths about what counts as bullying. It can take any form. And in 2019, the data was that one in five kids is bullied at school. One in five. And this is even higher in marginalized youth. And so, um, when, and, 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 and that's across the board in all of the many ways in which people are othered and marginalized in society. Um, so whether we're talking about um, autistic, ADHD, kids with learning disabilities, uh, students of color, LGBTQ plus youth, across the board, more, and one in five kids is bullied at school. That is not safe at school. Bullying is associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and I really want to highlight this, suicide. Experiencing bullying in school across the board at least doubles the risk of suicide. And by the way, suicide is the second leading cause of death in adolescence. And bullying is associated with negative mental health for all involved, those who are bullied, those who bully others, those who are bullied and bully others, and even being the bystander in a setting where bullying is tolerated. There's literature that shows that living in a community that tolerates bullying is stressful itself. Just that, living in a community that tolerates bullying is associated with having Worse academic performance and lower academic engagement. This impacts everyone. Great question. Um, and then seeing the chat, what is the leading cause of death for adolescents? It's accidents. And thanks for the question. Um, so not only is there a short-term impact of bullying, but even can be a lifelong impact. So now we're gonna shift um, with that really treacherous background, a focus on solutions. And there have been members of our local community who have been, who's, who have uh, been starting this conversation for a while now. And um, um, Adrian, I wonder, do you want to, do you want to say anything? I, actually, you're like, I don't want to say anything ever. Um, yeah, I'll just um, chime in. So I, we work with Mel and All Brains Belong. Um, thankfully, we found you all. You've been a saving grace for my family and my daughter, um, who's 14. Um, and we attend, well, they 
she attends the Montpelier a public school system. And last year in eighth grade was horrific for her in that she was bullied consistently for three or four months. And um, she finally was brave enough to tell us what was happening. She tried to deal with it herself and have a voice and have power, but it, and in the end, it nothing helped. And so we intervened, um, both myself and Mel and really like a whole army of people <laughs> to start kind of a conversation with the school district and, and trying to resolve a lot of these systemic issues. But it's huge. It is a huge, complex puzzle of policies and lack of training and understanding um, within our school system that it's just going to be a, a pretty big uphill battle. But I think if we um, think about small incremental changes over time, I feel like we could possibly make change in this big system. And we did create a Padlet that had community input and I've been talking to lots of people over the past few months and um, right now there's, I can't see much change happening. So I'm hoping this conversation continues where, you know, we continue to build momentum and really demand some change. Cause it's not, it's really just not fair to our kids. Thank you for sharing that Adrian. And I really, I, I, I thank you for your vulnerability in, um, in, 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 in driving these, conversations that need need to be had. Um, and Matthew's adding in the chat that, that, that within educational systems statewide that this is a problem, right? This is certainly not specific to, to you know, this is not just statewide, it's, I mean, it's, it's nationwide. Um, that uh, bullying happens in, 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 in all places. Um, and what I, um, and, and so, so what I'm gonna share with you is, um, the input that Adrian and um, the, the folks locally who have had um, several in-person community brainstorms and an ongoing virtual, I'm going to like just give a tour of, of the input that has come in from the community thus far. And then we will open up to for, for more ideas. All right. So this is a, 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 a platform called Padlet that I had that is new to me. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's more visually pleasing, I think, than, than Jamboard, which we usually use. Okay. Um, so in no particular order, I'm just literally reading. Um, and can, can you guys see this okay? Yeah, okay. Trauma-informed instruction. If you see something, say something. So interestingly, there's been there's literature on that um, about bystander training and 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 the efficacy of 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 peer intervention. And in fact, there's been independent literature showing that the presence of a peer that does not intervene that increase that 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 like allows the perpetuation of bullying. Recognizing others' accomplishments. I'm wondering if that's like speaking to like uh, regulation, self concept, self esteem. Um, provide one on one support or small groups. Um, yeah, so so really just thinking about um, making sure that that ed, like I think that also is speaking to like the theme of regulation of you know um, for um, you know since we all have different brains that learn differently um, in in settings where universal design is not present, um, there may be um, significant dysregulation regulation that comes from um, the educational experience being cognitively dysregulating. Sure. Um, there's a suggestion of a code of conduct agreement, modeling inclusion every day. And there's literature on a uh, positive climate. Um, we can talk about that. Teach the parents. Recognize neurodiversity. Lots of role playing and uh, workshops uh, led by actually interesting, like so older peers um, educating younger peers, regulating cell phones. Yeah, I think that is important given the increasing prevalence of cyberbullying. Uh, more, more arts, socio emotional learning, being more aware of what you say. It's an aspect of of of, of mindfulness and and, and self awareness. Um, so there's a, a comment about um, looking at like responses to bullying. So certainly we can we can talk about that um, because what we know is that punishment does not work. Punishment does not work. Um, education about the impact of bullying and what, what leads one to bully others, yeah, including being bullied by others. Respect, 
um, providing a course or so education prevention. Um, education about, so we got, we got some uh, duplication here, yep. Um, lots, of, lots of suggestions for, for education and training. Yeah, so having more administrative presence, walking around to be in classrooms, uh, sending the message to students that, that they're supported by those in charge. Yeah, and there, there is literature on supervision and particularly um, uh, because more, more, more um, bullying uh, occurs in settings um, where, where there's uh, secrecy. And, um, but, but not always, that's not across the board at all. Um, so more, 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 more uh, discussion of code of conduct. Yeah, um, yeah, make the school rules. So basically a zero tolerance and no tolerance policy, yeah. Um, clear understanding of what bullying is and uh, clear boundaries of tolerance. Yeah, I think that because there is um, some some mythology about, you know, that maybe this is developmental, you know, um, or to, in any way to be expected, whereas no. Um, education, restorative justice and inclusion rather than um, a, a punitive policies. Yeah, it's more, more discussion of education. Um, uh, uh, education about diversity, taking this time to understand all perspectives and context, training focused on prevention, peer programs with rotating leadership, focus on the primacy of the parent, I, I, you know, uh, primacy of relationships, connection, um, um, and, and maybe, maybe uh, continue free lunch, hungry people is built yet yeah, really just talking about, you know, I think that, that I think that suggestion really speaks to nervous system regulation. Um, uh, and, and, and I think like a, like a zoomed out look at regulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the chat, a link to this Padlet that folks can directly contribute to. Um, and I'm just going to open this up. And uh, we will we we can take notes. We can uh, just talk about this. You can type in the chat ideas that you have of concrete suggestions or things that you've seen work well. Like I I always think that a bright spotting approach when there are um, you know local cultures um, where bullying is not so much a problem. If anyone's ever seen that culture, I would love to know what works about that. And I'll also keep the Padlet up if folks are keeping that. Yeah, so I see a comment in the chat. It's so important for the adults to model between themselves collaborative problem solving and not bullying. Yeah, I think that all too often, you know, even though we, we brought this conversation up about the bullying problems of school age children, we totally live in a world where adults bully one another. And, you know, it's also okay if we want to start the conversation there about some practices that work in adult, like workplace settings that actually work. You know, just, I think it's, I, th I think uh, nothing's off the table. So um, we're, if, if, if I, I, I think that when we think about adults modeling so much, right? So from, you know, the, the, the experiences of co-regulation, leader self-regulation, all of these things um, that, that, that if we're not modeling ways of treating other people, that's really hard. And what I can say is dysregulated people don't have access to their cortex fully. Right, so if I can see where even the most well-intentioned adult um, is maybe just trying to survive and self-regulate, it's very hard to explicitly model strategies. So maybe like zooming out and saying, is everyone regulated? And if not, what might go into that, Sierra? 
Hi, everybody. Um, I just, I think that's a really good point, Mel, um, and um, people who are bringing it up in the chat. And it's something that I think about a lot as a, um, when I first started going into nursing, um, there was a lot of talk about how much bullying there is between nurses and adults. Um, and really the the research showed that most of that comes from burnout and most of that comes from people not getting their basic needs met. And so looking at that similarly where we're, we're targeting in these school-aged kids, we're targeting getting people's needs met, we're targeting burnout, we're targeting a system that's not built for them um, and a system that's not made for their um, love and safety in mind, I guess. Yeah, and there's so much that goes into that. By the way, Adrian, um, I, I wonder if as the moderator of the Padlet, it, I, just type, I just typed that into the Padlet and it says, you need to have yourself approved. So I wonder if, uh, we, yeah. Anyway, so if you, wanna, if you wanna moderate that, that'd be amazing. Cause I wonder if people are typing, we're not seeing it. Um, Laura and then Matthew after Laura. Yeah, I'm just thinking about um, my own, like my five-year-old being at daycare and sometimes coming home with stories. And I don't honestly know sometimes if she is the bully or the victim in her version of stories. And I think like communication between parents and teachers can be so important to know what actually happened so that I can counsel my child best on how they handle the situation. Because I think there are times that she comes home feeling victimized and then when I get more details realize that maybe she started out kind of in the wrong and then felt victimized by how people reacted to that and I think sometimes like my reaction could be very different in terms of how I coach her to respond to things knowing the full story if that makes sense so I feel like that parent coaching and then communication between parents and teachers being so important I would love to hear from, because um, I know we have some early childhood educators in in the crowd. I would imagine, and I'm just like, I don't even, I mean, I don't know what I just had to eat like five minutes ago. Like, I wonder, um, like, how does that play out? Because it's almost like my my view is that the way that kids treat each other starts like in toddlerhood and you know like 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 that model of inclusion and like how we regard everything starts like that 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 young and I I, I don't I don't I, I wonder if like the the rate limiting factor is you know how the systems that 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 make it really hard to even collect that feedback, let alone give it to families to generalize at home. Turtle Island crew, are you there? Hi. 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 We're here. What do, you, what do you think about um like the 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 um the interpersonal conflicts of really young children? Like how does that play out? Because you know you so 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 uh, and and how practical is it to have have um the details of the interpersonal conflict make their way home? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, we were sort of chatting as folks were sharing, and I, I think that's exactly right, that <clears throat> particularly at very young ages, children are, are experimenting with social dynamics and their own dynamic, um, and so the context is super, super important, what was happening before, during, and after, and so I totally agree that when parents and teachers are in close communication about really beautiful things and then about more challenging things too um, that can only be more helpful because you might hear something or see something and make an assumption when in reality um, something different 
was happening. Um, and there's just a lot of nuance, particularly at that really, really young age when they're still learning all of these different aspects and exploring and experimenting with social and power dynamics. That is the point that I was about to bring up and, and I, thanks, thanks for setting up that point because it is in really young kids, like, you know, preschool age kids when we're really thinking about um, the, it's normal development includes experimenting with power and having a self, like a healthy sense of agency and having opportunities to to have agency, to have freedom and choice um, so that it's not like a hurtful exertion of power over a someone else um, so that, that, that there's like healthy experiences of, of, of power, I think is also really important for those really, really young kids. Um, and um, I'm just uh, reading in the chat that it's so much easier to hear the challenging things when you've heard beautiful things from that same teacher or person. Yeah, so it, it just, it makes it, um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's all information and thinking about it, that it's not like a right and a wrong way to be um, in, 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 a, in a given social situation. It really, like, I think that framing everything in, in, at that, you know, it, so many things, but everything at that age about conflicting access needs. Your need was this. This is or this person's need was this. Like it's not. It's so this way. It's not like a judgment thing or like a shame thing because shame dysregulates nervous systems too. Um, Matthew, thank you so much for waiting. So you got Matthew and then Turtle Island crew after Matthew. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Mel Mel Hauser, for bringing this up. It's also it's not uh, when people, uh, children, uh, uh, students, uh, high schoolers, you know, all in that, you know, bully each other. It's like a counterproductive. It's one, it's counterproductive. It doesn't help anyone else. Two, it's like a protective measure. It's like, you know, I've been bullied so much in my life. You know, I had to bully to basically get myself out, you know, of the, these, these, you know, conflicts that are within myself or within others because bullying, you know, in some reality, it's a protective measure that some people have, you know, because they experience it at a young age or in life itself. It's like, you know, it's like counterproductive, like, you know what, I don't want to be, become that bully, but I have, but bullying is a way to protect myself that some people do that as a way to, you know, to keep them from being bullied. It's like I said, system within a system. Is intertwines of where the actual you know cause is. It's hard to disseminate against you know what is bullying tactic within a bullying tactic versus uh, I'm trying to use this as a protective countermeasure of bullying so I don't feel bullied ever again. And that is what I've been seeing across the state. It's like bullying people that bully each other are trying to protect each other. They're trying to protect themselves from being going into that, you know, process once again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it is very, very common for um, uh, people who bully others to be bullied themselves. And um, when we really think about how um, hurt people hurt people, um, really thinking about how uh, punishment and shame further dysregulating and isolating someone who is already dysregulated. That's why that doesn't work. Turtle Island crew, back to you. Thanks, Mel. Um, wanted to add too that I think a lot of times children, particularly young children, but I would, I would say all the way through up are also playing out <clears throat> what they're observing and wondering about. <clears throat> and so like Matt, Matthew was saying, wh why? Where is, where is this behavior or, or thing coming from and really peeling back the layers? Um, as an educator, that's a really important question is sort of the, the why, not necessarily the what. Um, and I think that goes across to, to all ages. And one of the re things we do at Turtle Island is really emphasize that collaborative problem solving, not only with our teachers, 
amongst one another, um, but also with the children to give that autonomy. And so that gets learned that you do have agency, you do have um, the ability to use your voice if comfortable. But again, I think one of the important things to recognize is does everyone have what they need? And in this society, this culture, this structure that we're working in, it's not true. And so you can't rely on the fact that people are going to be regulated all the time um, or are making the best decisions in that moment. Maybe they haven't eaten. So I think it's a really important thing to peel back and think about some of these structures that are sort of isolating us in, in the way. Absolutely. Um, and um, when 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 we when we think about so like you know basic um, uh, prerequisites of safety, there's so much that go into that, and it you can't look at bullying or school bullying in um, in in a in a vacuum, um, and we know that. Um, like like framing framing uh, conversations around having needs met, and this can be basic needs in in the way that are often thought about food, housing, um, and connection. Right, like connection is a basic need, and. Um, since we know that bullying happens um, across um, a, a, across contexts and settings and um, uh, I also want because um, sometimes I hear like, oh well bullying's not happening because everyone has food and housing. It's like, well no, well, Bullying is happening because the people who are experiencing it are describing it. That is their truth. That is the that, that. anyway. So I I I think that connection and validating the experiences of kids, like when they describe what's happening, if the kid says they don't feel safe, they are not safe. Sarah has in the chat such great. Points relationship building with parents is an important part of being a child care provider. Sorry, I'm like I, I, I that I, I'm delayed in catching up in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, I just you know one thing that I would love to see is you know once you get to middle school, um, you know when a student says that you know they are I mean it's happening now I'm still hearing these crazy stories at middle school and I'm like what is happening you know if a child is coming to the parent or even a friend saying I'm not feeling safe in school because this person you know is making me feel very uncomfortable like that's a very clear <laughs> message for a 12 year old 13 year old person to say and you know our society right now and if I hear this like one more time I think my brain might explode <laughs> is oh that's just the way they are like that's boys will be boys and I'm like oh my god so it would be so nice to have I don't even know what it is but like you know we people have their lived experiences and have you know people say oh well, I, I survived middle school like you can too like we have to change that that I don't know what it is, but that saying and like that feeling, like I, I truly believe that it doesn't have to be that way. And if there was some training or like awareness around, like if someone comes to you, a child and says, I'm not feeling safe in school, like immediately there should be action taken or like a resolution or like those conversations that, you know, maybe going on in early childcare, like that is not happening at middle school at all. Like something has completely been dropped off and it's always like, well, it's fine. You'll get over it. Just stay strong. And like, what? Like, it's really terrible lessons we're teaching our kids. And I just hope that, I don't know if I could wave my magic wand, there'd be some type of training or education around how to handle some of the, you know, those, those situations as the kids get a little bit older 
or even in elementary school. I don't know where it stops, but it does. Well, I don't think it does stop because I think that, um, you know, across developmental levels, um, the, 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 the language used um, may change, depend, you know, so, 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 you know, as kids develop and their relationships change, it's like each time there's a recalibration of relationships, there needs to be different kinds of training. So like in younger kids, it's like a, it's like a top down, um, you know, here's, here's how the world works. Um, and, 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 and like, um, uh, responses like teletrusted adult like that might work for younger kids and then older teens they don't do that so there needs to be like just anyway thinking through the developmental lifespan um of 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 like a uh a, a, a differential responses there's um uh in the chat um it uh, uh laura shares it adrian it's so true i still get chills thinking back to my middle school experiences and i think one of the hardest parts is that parent involvement can ultimately make it worse. And that feels awfully helpless as a parent, right? Because of, of retaliation is, is, is a thing. Um, and um, often I um, encourage uh, families, patient families to like um, have, have, have that discussion when there are reports made to school of like, explain to me and describe to me what the plan is for preventing retaliation because like sometimes it's it's um it's not thought about um and there's a question for you adrian are middle school teachers and staff getting training currently where you are i don't know i know and mel you know the the it's what is it ibs or well, not IBS, it's um they're trained very, our, the school district that I live in, they belong, they believe in, um, gosh, what the heck is that called? It's not PBIS. Yeah. It's like the punishment kind of like, oh, positive did. behavior. Is that, yeah. Yeah. yeah so PBIS yeah. is um, not the most neuroculturally competent method that is what i have to say about that and when we're really thinking about um hi um when i really think about um it's so hard to like ideate and be diplomatic and speak at the same time i have a kind of brain for whom like all those things yeah. at once. I, I would, or, we met with our school district and we said it was baloney, very, very bluntly to our school district. And um, we tried to in, try to encourage our school district multiple times to look at different trainings and, and support for our, our teachers in terms of like, um, you know, Jenny and I were, we're going to be taking the training, Jenny Sheehan, who just joined us on CPS, the Ross Green model, and then thinking about how do we incorporate that maybe just through our own avenues of influence. Um, we do have a bullying and harassment policy at our school district, and I know that the teachers are trained on the policy. Um, it's like a 30 minute training once a year by the, the school district's attorney, um, but they do use they. That's that's it. That's all I know. And I'm sure there's other training throughout the year in terms of professional development. And, you know, they're very big into restorative circles. But, you know, if you're getting bullied, if you're getting bullied and you don't have the foundation, don't throw the everyone in the same room together to have a talk. <laughs> it's because right, that's not safe. Oh, it's terrible. That's what they wanted to do. I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> let's not do right. that. Right. But right. Yes. Um, you know, and, and sometimes when I talk with even my young patients who are being bullied, I ask them, like, what do you think um, is going on there? Like, why do you think that's happening? Like, what do you think about kids who are mean to other kids? And um, it's, it's interesting because really young 
kids have the ability to, to essentially come up with the concept of hurt kids, hurt kids. Um, and then as time goes by, it's like the, the, the longer that time goes by, my observation is that um, that, that lens shifts because there's the internalization of that there's something about me that is being treated this way. So I think that Adrian, to your point about when a kid says that something's happening and a kid is, 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 is naming that, it's so important to validate that and to name that this is not their fault. This is a this is a trauma. This is like any trauma, um, and I think that that is a con. Like um, that lens is not always shared um, with the kid. Like naming it for the kid, um, because like what we do not want is we don't want to drive a society of of of, of developing people to launch into the world that one don't trust their themselves they like lose track of their intuition because of like all of the adults that have invalidated them of like you don't you don't know your reality you're out of touch with your reality it's re that is really harmful long term laura so i have a question that i i, I don't know i'm like thinking through my own childhood and my kids and all kinds of parenting things and how do you balance teaching a child to be true to themselves and to be themselves and wear what you want and do your hair the way you want express yourself the way you want while also teaching them like self-protection like I feel like I was taught to conform as a means of avoiding bullying and that has its own repercussions like how what do you tell your patients or families or like teachers in the room how do you balance that with like there is safety in conforming but then there are risks in conforming too yeah and I think that the difference between conforming and code switching um, is really important right so you're not changing who you are because there's something wrong with who you are, um, it's it's um, it's it's you may choose to to do this or that as a strategy that gets you something, um, or you may not. Not because there's like one right way of being, but I would also say that it's really very hard when, especially like as a parent, if you have been bullied um it's very hard to like not have that trauma response and like the 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 fear and the like drive to want to protect your kids from harm that you yourself have experienced but it ends up like um I think for many people like driving in like some forms of intergenerational trauma in parenting dynamics because like our parents didn't deal with their stuff and they end with that they had with their parents and like then so on and so on and so on anyway but I, I'd love to hear what others what others have to say about that about how how as a parent um you um uh can can uh, can 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 approach this balance of like your cortex says I want you to be you, but your limbic system has some kind of response. Um, this is Sierra. I can, I can say that one thing I think about a lot when we talk about intergenerational trauma is pairing it with intergenerational healing and the idea that you're talking to your kids about bullying and talking to them about how like whatever you know the system's unfair you know this is horrible and talking to them about the difference between code switching and conforming yourself to be somebody else um just the fact that we're like talking to our kids about that is huge um and 
a huge step in the right direction. Um, and so I think I get a lot of comfort of knowing that like, I don't have to have all the right answers to still be making a positive change. Yeah, because that is something that never, that, 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 that maybe was not done in a prior generation. And in the chat, um, one of the most powerful things a parent can say is, I believe you. And you're also getting um, validation of, uh, of, of what you shared, Sierra. Another comment, um, I often got told one thing and then shown another, like be yourself, but then obvious cues to conform. Yeah, 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 so totally. So it's, um, it, but it also like, I think as, as, as a parent, like I'll give you an example, like of something I didn't do really, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do very well. Um, so we were in an outdoor group setting and Luna made a particularly loud noise and I gave feedback that like maybe it was not the most awesome thing to make that noise. My cortex like knows that that's not what I wanted to say. My limbic system, A, had a response to the noise itself. And B, had this like narrative of like, I don't want to be perceived as the parent that let another kid get a noise made really close to their face. And so anyway, when I really, um, the, 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 we were outside, so it was gonna be hard to like have a visual support on the wall, but like the visual support I wanna take around with me is that like my relationship with my child is the most important thing. It's the most important thing to me. And so if I, if my cortex could like remind my limbic system that like all day, I would do better at this topic. Thanks for nodding, Laura. Uh, I think what you were saying was interesting to me because when I think about being a kid and and avoiding being bullied and the things I did to avoid, to watch and perceive, and then participate in ways maybe that was out of my integrity for my own safety, it was like, I probably, I was probably having so many different conflicts within myself because on one hand, my limbic system is going, I don't, I know that I'm, a, I would be a target because I'm already a fat kid and I'm already getting called fat. And I already know I have no power because of that. But also if I don't join, there's danger, you know? So it's, it's sort of like, how do you, like teach kids their own responsibility to themselves in honoring the participation that they might not even feel good about, you know, participating in, in that way. Um, Cause I definitely would have stood up and had stood up in different times. Um, but you lose your power so quickly, even if you're a kid who would stand up for somebody else. And I, as a social worker in the school system, I ex experienced the exact same thing with the teachers. Like no teacher wanted the social worker to come in. And it was like, you're, you're dealing with the exact same thing professionally as you did when you were a kid within the school setting. And so I think sometimes teachers or social workers or nurses, like there is that whole pecking order kind of normative behavior it's the same it can be the same dynamic and I think if you're not drawing that dynamic out like Sierra was saying like even in nursing school like being burnt out or but I think it's just even like how does inclusion start at the top like from the principal or from the teachers in them understanding their own relationship to th themselves as being potentially bullied or being the bullier and how does that reflect on the way that they're running their classroom in school? 
Amy, that is so well said. I have to like, I'm going to like, when I rewatch the video of this, I really want to sit with that because I think that part of the paradigm that says, if I don't bully, I lose my power starts from where the power came from. So like, if the power came from power over someone else, as opposed to something else that like in an earlier developmental stage um, could have could have been potentially grounded differently. Um, you know, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, like something happens that doesn't go the way you want. And if if the self-narrative, which came from the narrative of others of like, you know, what's wrong with me? What's matter with me? Why am I like this? Um, that you're going to have a different, different response. So I just kind of, I, I think that your, your, your point is so important. And it sounds like since we know that many of the people who bully other people um, are bullied themselves, um, whether that's in school or outside of school, um, really like 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 uh, almost like going more upstream of where did one sense of power come from? And to Matthew's point um, about like um, like bullying for safety, like that is I mean that's just it's so common. So it's where does safety derive from? Where does power derive from? And uh, you know, I, 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 and teaching those concepts explicitly in, in really little kids. Like with my five-year-old, we talk a lot about power. We watch a lot of cartoons and we describe like the 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 power dynamics amongst like villains and other characters and uh so my five-year-old will, will literally be able to distinguish between like an evil character versus oh no they're not a villain they're just dysregulated mama because we've been talking about it that way since the dawn of time laura I'm also thinking through like little ways that we teach our kids to take back the power. Like I'm, so I'm thinking of my son. Every time I do my daughter's nails, she wants them cut, like the bribe to get her to clip her nails is to have her paint her nails. And now when my son gets his nails clipped, he wants to paint his nails. And my like gut heteronormative way of thinking is that if he paints his nails, he's going to get bullied. And so there's this immediate like, no, boys don't do that that then makes my child a bully of boys who do that. Like, and so I've had to like try and do a lot of bias checking in myself and letting go of the idea and then embracing the power of like, yep, boys do do that and you can do that. And I'm gonna make, I'm gonna empower you with that instead of making it something you use to hold power over somebody else. Sierra and I both agree that that is such a great example because it's like like um your first narrative um like uh the your like your first draft um is always going to be the thing that you laid down when you were a little kid um and you know um your cortex might know that there is no right way to experience gender and that there's this distinction between um, uh, gender identity, gender expression, and that these like genderized things like the way you dress or like your hair or your nails or whatever, that they're actually like not an, like they're, there's just no reason for it. But like when we were kids, there was a different narrative and it got hardwired. And so like, you, you think you're just your cortex, um, when your cortex is offline, you don't have access to this, this stuff because it's new. Yeah, Laura's adding, yeah, like actually who cares? But it took me so long to actually not care. Yeah, because especially when you were bullied for how you showed up in the world, of course we're not gonna want our kids to go through the painful experiences that we endured, of course. And um, um, it, it's, it's, it's like, um, 
the patterns, unless you like do the, like Sierra's point about the healing, the intergenerational healing, like doing the work of, 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 of healing is, is probably an important part of that. Um, so, so, so like, cause probably your limbics, like all of our limbic systems are gonna keep getting triggered by the thing. And it's so hard. And so that's why like talking about it, you know, this is like a common, a super common thing. Uh, just, just look on Instagram, all the people posting about this. Like this is a thing of, of intergenerational healing to rewrite those narratives. Um, so uh, we've, we've got a, a couple minutes left. I want to create some space um, if, if anyone else would like to, to share thoughts. Matthew. My thought is with bullying tactics across the board is when can we have that those important discussions and conversations and topics within the what you call bullying 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 tactic system and how can we know us as individuals teach the students the children about why we should not bully each other because in society you know it's like you know if i bully one person then you're going to bully them all and i don't the way i look at it is we got to get away from that narrative that you know narrative and paradox and bullying spectrum of how it is and how to you know how can we move away from that toxic system that's intertwined with, you know, with everyday life. How can we all, you know, educate, best educate the children in a way where it makes sense for them? Thank you. Yeah, and I think that um, like, like zooming out and thinking about developmentally appropriate, neuroculturally sensitive um, approaches right from the ground up. Because um, safety, you know, when you feel un, you know, so so when we when we we think about that connection and co-regulation experience, um, I think that is a place where this all starts to make sure that everybody has a genuine connection in their lives. with people who they can show up and feel safe with. And that we don't expose people to, um, to, to, to not have that sense of agency of getting out of unsafe environments. Because if the limbic system does not feel safe, it's because it's not safe. Matthew, then we're gonna wrap up. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, what you said was uh, that that's very important is, you know, that safety culture of our limbic systems, you know, of how to interact, you know, on a not only emotional level, but on a level where, you know, that uh, that bullying, it's like, you know, it's a way to express ourselves in a negative way. And it's like, you know, we're trying to save ourselves from being hurt again. And it's like, you know, it's like, where's, it's like, I'm lost. I, I need help. Where can I go from here? And what can I do to stop myself from, you know, not being hurt again, but I want to stop myself from actually bullying other people in the same way that I was treated. Thank you. Right, and I, 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 I think that um, that 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 narrative is is one of the pathways. It's not the only pathway, and it's certainly not the um, you know it's it's an important part of of the whole picture. Um, and I think that um, uh, 
Uh, one of one, you know, in 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 preparing for for tonight, I was I was reviewing the evidence for like you know it's like evidence based bullying prevention programs in schools, and there are a number of them out there. And um, one of the very common um, uh, terms that's used is about um, a positive culture. And there are actually instruments out there to assess positive culture and like um, of, 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 of actually like taking a baseline um, of, 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 of sampling um, not, not, not just the people that work in the environment, but actually sampling the kids um, and we talk a lot about that. We've talked a lot about that with different kinds of topics here that like asking kids is I think an, a really important next step of this conversation because kids have incredible ideas. The, 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 the wisdom of kids and teens um, is, is, um, is one of my favorite things in the world. So I, I, I think I would like to see that as one of the next steps of this conversation. Well, thank you all. Thank you all so much for, for being here and participating. And Adrian, can folks continue to add to the Padlet? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I will, um, uh, when I send out the recording, I will also send the Padlet out. Um, and do we have, um, are, are, there, are, are, are there plans um, for, uh, like, I don't know if, if, um, if, if the kids in your life and the people in their lives like have looked at the Padlet and if there's anything else that like kids, kids um, can, can, like, can, can, can the Brain Club attendees ask their kids and add ideas that way too? Yeah, I think it's open to anybody. And, um, you know, I think what my vision was, was to take that at least for where my sphere of control is within the school district that I work in, or I'm not working, I don't work in the school district. Operate in. <laughs> Live in, um, is to share it with the school board and because they're interested and they're trying to yeah. make change, but they don't know what to do. So I'm hoping this will be a little bit of a roadmap. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the and the great thing is that the you know the the, the leadership is open to this, like yeah. open to saying like, okay, um, I want community input, and we need to do it differently. Um, and I I I I really I really appreciate that because you know we don't we don't see that everywhere, not to be taken for granted. Um, but I think the um, the the more ideas the better. So thank you all so much for being here. And um, we will see you next Tuesday. Bye.